84, 85. Uh, that's the year that I'm not here, it's Amy's. That's right, it was Amy then, and uh... This is when you started, 84? 84, was, it, was the first jam here, yeah. Well... We're at Grossman's, by the way. Legendary no, no, Grossman's 75-year anniversary. Well, so that's well, the camera. Oh, we're on now? Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm uh, I first played with Jeff. He used to come and see me at a place called, uh, see a band called Buzz Upshaw that I played with uh, in the early 80s. Yeah, we used to play the. Cheers, man. Cheers. Thanks for taking the time. Christine and Grossman's. Yeah, good health. Musicians in bars getting beer. Tom Stevens. There you go. There you go. The idea of the book, which um, took a few years to write, was. Um, Never done an interview this way, so <laughs> I'll have to, That's what they all say. Yeah, I'll figure it out. I'm talking to the camera. Is is uh, was really a, a work of, of necessity because what was happening is uh, I was realizing. Um, do I look at you once in a while? You can look anywhere you okay. want. Okay, yeah. Christine over there. Yeah. It, the book was really a, a, a work of necessity because what was happening was. Um, I've been on the sideline for several years, and I was reading a lot of things about our band, Jeff, the band, and a lot of the uh, musical releases that were coming out that were either just not correct, or were reinventing history, or musically, for instance, uh, some of the things that were released were tracks that I knew Jeff hated. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't accurate, it wasn't honest. The second reason, was because um, those conversations where you're shooting the breeze about great guitar players, um, and I spent a lot of time in the States and Europe and whatnot, all of a sudden Jeff Healy wasn't in those conversations anymore. And that really scared the hell out of me. Because, um, you know, obviously I have a bit of ego in this, but I, I love Jeff. And uh, Jeff uh, was in my estimation one of the greatest my guitar players in the world, and you don't have to take my word for it. Um, you know, we played with George Harrison and Stevie Ray Vaughan and uh, uh, all the greats, and uh, those guys, they, they, they were the ones that told me how great Jeff was. And to be losing Jeff to history was unacceptable. So that's when I decided to write the book. And very similar to our career, it was not an overnight book. It took me five, almost six years to to write it, and uh, also very similar to our career, uh, I had to find an American co-writer because uh, no one in Canada was that interested, uh, sadly. Um, luckily, the guy that came on board was a fellow called uh, Keith Greenberg, and uh, Keith had written a bestseller already about John Lennon and uh, a bunch of crime uh, novels and, or sorry, true life things. Is, uh, what, what was his interest with Jeff? Um, his interest was Jeff, was uh, a guy who owed me rent <laughs> and skipped on me, was in New York and he said, look, we can work the rent thing out, but I, I met this really major producer, writer guy, and uh, I mentioned that I was living with you, not the part that I owed you rent, but uh, um, you know, he'd be interested in talking to you because he, I mentioned that you were thinking of writing a book. And uh, I happened to be in New York and uh, we hit a couple pubs. And uh, about three days of some pub crawling, and I realized that um, first, what I didn't know is how to write a book, and secondly, how sacred the subject matter was. So, who I was doing with this with had to to get it, and had to understand it, and had to it had to be an honest rendition of of the history of the Jeff Ely Band. And, and Jeff, I mean, Jeff was clearly the star. And we kicked the tires for probably two years. And uh, he was in LA one time and I was there around the same time and we hung out and all of a sudden it clicked. Because more importantly, I could feel him trying to get a center. Like what's, what's, what's the story about it? You know, where's this meeting myself? Or where's this guy, where's Tom coming from? And it came down to a very simple agreement. Um, Honesty. 
this guy's a world-class researcher. He's done, you know, Aretha Franklin, Trump. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, think of who he hasn't done, and it'd be a shorter list. And I was flattered in the sense that he felt that Jeff's story and the band's story was worth his time. And this is a busy guy and a sought-after guy, and that meant a lot. But that wasn't enough. What really mattered was he got it. And it became clear that he got it. And the main thing he wanted from me was, Tom, I do a lot of my own research, and if it comes back you're a jackass, or this isn't what you think it is, or what you said it was, it's going in the book. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, that's the book we wrote, in, in my opinion. In, in fact, I, I, I take a pretty good beat in the book, and I'm proud of that. Oh, is that right? Sure, but I, I'm glad of that because... Uh, it's Saved by the bell. It's uh, Grossman's. Yeah, I'd rather have a few beers and that's right. deal with the noise. We'll deal with it in the editing. It's <laughs> really weird to do an interview here about Jeff. Isn't it? Well, this is our home. It's your home, you know? home away from home. Yeah, it was for many, many, many years. Okay, so go back. You take you. So the we make the deal, which is is hard on you a little bit. I sure it is. Okay, the, go ahead. the first draft, I read it, and and I was kind of surprised to find out friend and foe, the people he had interviewed. You know, I, I, I had my share of glory, but also had some shots, and that that excited me because then I realized, okay, there's no sugarcoating here. Yeah. You know, this is this is the real Honestly, deal. Yeah. yeah, the guy's keeping his word. And, uh, and now I got to keep my mouth shut because I agreed to it. So and uh, That'd be now, cool. yeah, but it was cool because at the same time, you know, sure Jeff takes some lumps. Uh, um, Joe not as many because they candidly me and Joe haven't really been in touch. So I think the guy was working off the research and in, in, in my interviews and some of Rody's interviews and, and yeah. uh, road manager interviews, those kind of things. So so off we go. Um, Am I still on topic here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now we do the first draft, and that takes... I had no idea how hard it was to write a book. And it's hard to write a book at a couple levels. A, um, I knew I knew there's an audience out there that didn't like me too much. And, and, you knew about this. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been animosity for many years. And, and you know, in a way, you sort of know you're walking into that again. Well, let's go. Let's come back to that part later. But okay, so part one is yeah, um, and it's hard to write the book because it, it's hard to write a book because uh, wow, energy, time, yeah. uh, memory, trying to get it right in your mind, and I think in the first few pages, uh, we came up with this when we were drunk one night. Actually, huh. it was kind of like you know, Keith, it's kind of like this. I spent a lot of nights like this at the beginning, so I'm telling stories that. Um, you know, including some of the people you're interviewing, I mean, we were a hard partying band in the old days. And uh, so through, through, through that prism and history and a little lack of memory and a little bit of, you know, partying and a little bit of this, some of this might not be 100% accurate. But that's where Keith was dead on. Because whatever I told him, he checked it out three, four, five times. Uh, enough that I, I think it's safe to say that the book's pretty darn accurate. I, you know, I'm sure there's some screw-ups there if we got called on it, um, but it's not a book that's bullshit. And, and what kind of saves my bacon, if there is some bullshit, is, uh, I can't remember, but a couple of guys in the book mentioned, um, um, Tom wasn't necessarily a, uh, he was a guy that told stories, but he seemed to be a guy that stories kind of followed him around. And I wasn't quite sure what that meant till I, I read some of the interviews. The reality is I, I managed to get in a lot of crap along the way, and uh, as did the band. And, which brings us to management, because the other side to realize in the book is co-managers, there, there's days where, there, there's days where, um, you know, I'm, I'm giving the band hell because we're supposed to be doing this or that, and meanwhile, uh, maybe I'd gone missing and missed a pretty important sound check. So it was, uh, you know, that whole self-management thing had right. pros and cons. Right, right. The other thing that happens in the book is is you realize um, the greats, you know, uh, we get interviewed. Um, uh, you know, like guys like Slash, who's not our generation necessarily, 
I'm paying you the five dollars and somewhere else. Blown away by Jeff. <laughs> then you have this lovely letter from George Harrison, blown away by Jeff. Uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, uh, you know, Mr. King, who, God bless him, what a gentleman. Um, so, what we're starting to shape up is look, even if Tom Stevens full of shit, these guys aren't. Those things don't yeah. I mean, these guys are telling their stories, or they're in the media, or it's been so well researched that if Tom said, maybe King loved Jeff, but we almost didn't make it because my cousin, you know, sued him back in, I don't know, whatever year it was in Halifax, that story's there. You know, and, it's, and, it's, and that's what's great about it, uh, if I may say. So you, you mentioned Albert, Albert King, Albert Collins. Albert Collins, Albert King. Sorry. Albert Collins, BB King. BB King. Yeah. But uh, Albert Collins was at Brunswick House, was that or Albert Hall at least? Right. In Toronto. Right. Now, now, candidly, kudos to Corey because Corey was the uh, manager at the time. I just met Jeff and was getting known. But in that time, I'm getting to know Jeff. Um, what what happens is, uh, let me have a, maybe we need a shot. Albert yeah, I mean Albert Collins had already um, Jeff had jam with Albert, and then uh, because of Corey, uh, Corey had set that up at Albert Hall, and uh, you know they invite Jeff back, and uh, there's Stevie Ray Vaughan, and uh, one of, one of my favorite pictures in the book. Jeff's not in it. It's Stevie and Albert Collins with their arms around each other, looking at Jeff. Oh, that, that's on Jeff's stage. That, that it's picture. on Albert's hall. That's yeah. amazing. And Jeff's do, clearly doing his solo, but it's a shot of them looking at Jeff with their arms around each other with these big grins. And that's why I put it in the book. Everyone said, well, "Where's Jeff?" That's not the point. That's right. The point is these two legends are clearly Being blown away oh. and, 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 and having a blast. That you know. Here's this kid blowing their minds, and, and Jeff did that forever, you know, till the end. Now, another reason I wrote the book is um, I don't mind taking abuse and stories being changed and whatnot, but what I do mind is when people are telling things that happened that didn't happen, or accusing me of things that I know are bullshit, and I, I have family, friends, and after sitting on a sideline for nine or ten years, you kind of go, fuck them. That's clear. Are, are, are you allowed to swear in this? Yeah, man. It's YouTube. Yeah, it, it, it's your show. Oh, it's YouTube? Fair enough. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, fuck them. Enough's enough. And then what starts happening is when I try and do positive things around the band that I co-founded with Jeff and, and then Joe joined us later, but nevertheless was in Novel Park, um, um, you kind of go, eh. You know, things start happening. Uh, there's a release where all of a sudden they've taken my drum tracks off the record. Well, wait a minute, man. Like that's just not cool. Or there's, uh, or there's things like well, this was Jeff's favorite track. When I know goddamn well, the reason it was never in any record is he hated the damn track. I mean, no one knows that better than me because I dealt with Jeff every day. Enjoy. Or, or better still, uh, first time ever released. It's been on two or three records already. So you're kind of like. Okay, once we're getting there, enough's enough. You know, it's time to step up and, and, and get the story out. Yeah, so clear it up and... Oh, you, you do your best. Yeah. No, no. And like I said, you've got authentic research happening. You're not doing it on your own. You're not bullshitting your way through it. Somebody's oh. checking out these stories. No, no, hopefully, hopefully not. Now, I'm a storyteller. I'm the first to tell you. Yeah. I love drinking. I love telling stories. I love shooting the shit. I'm a maritimer, and you know that's how I grew up. And uh, but one thing I do know about me, and this is where I have to sort of blow my own horn somewhat because I wasn't. I was stepping back. And my friends and family started saying, "How much longer are you going to take this crap?" It's one thing, you know, to get beat up in a court or a legal letter. It's a whole other thing when there's things, you know, on radio and TV and Tom did this and Tom did that when you know goddamn well, it's just uh, nonsense. And uh, not to go to the negative, but the negative turned into a positive. Because at the same time, I'm now learning people are starting to forget about Jeff. So it, it kind of took that negative to have the balls to jump into the positive, which was, wait a minute, how are we forgetting about Jeff? So that's, that's what I've got to say. Uh, I, 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 I just want to uh, 
have one last thing yeah, to sure. me. I warned you, if you get me going, no problem. I'm a hard guy. But since the books and rent were now in a couple of months, forgetting reviews and good, bad, and different, what's touched me the most are obviously first the fans who have reached out, but more importantly, friends of Jeff who are not fans of mine who have really gone out of their way to reach out to me through third parties, because I'm not on the internet or that. And, and actually say, you know what, Tom, read the book, and you know what? Some guys even said, love the book, but you, you caught the Jeff we knew, um, we, you caught the band that we think we knew, and, and we learned a couple of things we didn't even, even know about, and conversely, I learned things from them that I didn't know about. And, and then in these kind of interviews, what I realized is, man, my book kind of sucks because I heard way better stories from people who've been interviewed, me, whether it be radio or TV or whatnot. And Everybody has a story about Jeff, right? A million of them. I have one. Fire. <laughs> you know, well, I actually have a couple, but uh, um, one is uh, the story of his 50th birthday at Massey Hall. It was amazing. Really loved that night. Are you, are you yeah, that? Oh, yeah, good. yeah, that's right. And uh, the, the other one is uh, at Healy's Hideaway. The original one on, on Bathurst. On Bathurst. Right. I, uh, I stepped up to him. It was, uh, you know, the jazz set that he was doing, trumpet and right. The, right. He had the violin, Drew Jarecki on violin and stuff like that, right? So they had a, they took a break and I stepped up. I kind of snuck up behind him, you know, because you can't see you coming. So, <laughs> so I, I you just might went be surprised. up to him and I, I just kind of whispered in his ear so, sort of thing. Jeff, it's uh, kind of a long way from Larry's hideaway, wouldn't you say? And he said, thank God for that. <laughs> you know, the, the reason I said that is because he must have been 18. Larry's hideaway, Larry's, yeah. Yeah. Larry's hombres is sure. celebrating their 35th anniversary. Oh and uh, their 35th anniversary is at, is at the Newfoundland. Or just, anyway. Well, well, you know, but what's beautiful about what he's calling me is those guys are still doing it. Yeah. I was just looking at the tribute to the Nationals here at Grossman's. Those guys played every Sunday night here, Christ, as long as I can remember. <laughs> this been 45, 47 yeah. years here. I 75 mean, years of Grossman's. And, it, and, 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 and think about the talent that's come out here. I mean, in our case, we broke. The night we got signed was here. Well, the night right the, the, the night the two A and R guys came up from New York City. It was to Grossman's. Right here, because uh, the argument was at, at that point we were, we were a big bar band, but we still couldn't get arrested as far as labels. And I'd gone off to New York, and the boys would trust me enough. And uh, um, it, it, it's in the book. I won't get into all the details, but they came up to uh, Epic and uh, Epic and uh, no, sorry. Was it Epic? It's in the book, like this. It's in the book. <laughs> but what matters, the guy we all played sign with is, is Mr. Clive Davis, and uh, his guy was uh, 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 Mitchell Cohen. And we didn't realize that both the and guys showed up on the same night here in Grossman. Now, these they are don't big. really do that. I didn't even know that. I mean, you know, and they're there in the same audience. And, uh, and uh, you know, we debated where, where should we play, and it's like, well, fuck, it's a no brainer. Grossman, this is where we started. And, but, you know, it's Grossman's, there's no gear, there's no setup. But the way I looked at it was, man, if we can nail it in Grossman's and they sign us, then we, we would, you know, it's only going to go uphill. You know, like, like, you know, from there. And that's not off in Grossman's because the beautiful thing about the Grossman's Tavern um, uh, since, since, since uh, I think the 40s, when it was founded by the Grossman's, and then the Louis took it over, is that how many bands from Rough Trade, you know, to, to I mean, we broke uh, Amanda Marshall at uh, Grossman's. Yeah, I mean, Jeff founded it her here at Grossman's. So, I mean, this place, you know, this is why, yeah, it's great when you get to play Massey Hall, but Grossman's to me still means more than playing Massey Hall. I don't mean that in, awesome. in, in a negative way, but. Uh, obviously, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so tell me then, what were. I mean, obviously the movie is huge. The movie was a huge part of your career and uh, Jeff's uprising, you might say. But there must have been some other gigs that were fun, on the same level, or maybe even a higher level of fun. Uh, the, 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 the movie or the... Yeah, like work-wise, like which, which gigs made you realize, like, here we are. 
Oh, oh, here we are. Um, I think I, I, I think it was in the gig. The here we were was the first time you hear Angel Eyes on the radio. Um, everywhere we were on a world tour, and whether you're in America or Germany or Canada, there's Angel Eyes. Now, now keep in mind um, when we managed ourselves and started our own label. Um, how the Blues Man, the Lavin Brothers, were kind enough to record us in Vancouver, and we cut "See the Light" in Indiana. Not the "See the Light" that ended up on our first official Arista uh, uh, BMG record, but the "See the Light." No offense to Arista, who we were great folks, but the original version kicks ass, and uh, for a lot of reasons, because we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Um, um, time and clocks and all that shit was thrown out the window and we just kicked the crap out of it. And it's just got Jeff's guitar solo and energy. I mean, no one played like Jeff. I mean, there's just, you know, it's so weird. I was in Jamaica a few weeks ago. And uh, I hear this riff, guitar riff. And right away I go, man, that's Jeff Hewitt. And, uh, but I'm in the middle of a jungle and I'm like, it can't be Jeff Hewitt. And I walk around this path and there's this dude jumping up and down, dancing to see the light. Probably about 30 years old. Probably high out of his mind, Jamaica being Jamaica. <laughs> and I looked at the guy and I realized he's playing a live Jeff Healy record. This is uh, two months ago. And Two months ago? Two months ago. And I realized, I knew that note the second I heard it. That's how great Jeff was. He had his own sound. Yes. But still, that's, a, that's a, the radio. Oh, but, you, but, but you mean the gig? Yeah, gig-wise, like, was it, you know, a city that uh, you arrived at, or was it a kind of a, an arena that you arrived at? Yeah. Go ahead. When, 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 I knew, when I knew we had made it, this, I believe it was in, uh, in uh, Seattle, and uh, we're in a limousine with the promoter, and we're driving into this big park, and there's literally thousands of people walking along. And uh, beautiful girls, a younger crowd, you know, hipsters and cool and younger crowd. And, and I'm looking at the, uh, at the promoter and going, wow, you know, what's going on? Like, you know, what's, where are all these people going? And the guy looked at me and he's like, to see you guys. <laughs> That's how much we had no idea. No idea. How much? 88, I think that 88, 89, because it was simultaneous for the where the Angel Eyes was just hitting the chart, yeah. and uh, and also the movie uh, oh. soundtrack was coming out at the same okay. time. So we had a one-two coming in there. And, and the uh, it's just multiplying. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go four or five years, you get nothing. Then all of a sudden you're signed. And one thing about the Americans, uh, Clive Davis and, and Arista Records, when you got signed, you got signed. I mean, you know, he sends me a script. Back to Albert's Hall, funny how, how Everything goes full the circle. script for Roadhouse was at Albert's Hall? Indirectly, yes, and I'll tell you why. He, he, he sends the script, and he goes, look, don't, don't bring it up to the band or Jeff or anyone at this point. Just read it. I go, you know, sorry, sir, but we, we make all our decisions together. And I call Mr. Davis, sir, to this day, because he's a sir. I mean, if there's a sir in the business, he's a sir. And well, let me say you're a sir, too, at this point. So. Continue, sir, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's we'll see how that goes over. Anyway, uh, uh, the, the, the thing is, when you read the script, it's a man featuring a blind, crazy, out of sight, major MF guitar player, you know, fronting this trio. Right down to, you know, the trio here, the whole deal. And uh, I went back to him and said, wait a minute. Guys, there's, there's only one band in the world that I know of like that. I mean, there's no internet, but I know enough. You know, you hear what's what. And, the, and of course, the response is, why the hell do you think we sent it to you? <laughs> no one knows why at the time we're there. Off I go and I meet the producer out in Hollywood. A guy called Joe Silver, who at the time had done Die Hard, and he was the guy. And uh, it's just like the movies. You're waiting to go in and see this guy, and he's scary. And he's yelling and screaming and people coming and crying. And wow. You're up to bat and now you go. <laughs> and he's like, well, what the, f what the fuck are you like? And what are you here for? Well, Mr. Davis said, well, what, about what? I go, well, wow, he was kind of clueless. 
He's a busy guy. Oh my gosh. He's got like five, six, seven movies on his. To the, and, and, and I go, uh, well, we're the band that's supposed to be in a movie, I think it's called Roadhouse. And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He goes, oh, you got your video. I go, well, actually, sir, uh, sitting on your desk there. Like, like I learned about all executives, they don't know how to work shit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, someone comes running in, and in those days it's a VHS, and they get in. And it's our video that we made to back up the two songs we did with the, uh, the, 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 the Powder Blues guys, the Latin Brothers. A guy called Resnick, uh, first name to come to you second, from Ryerson, came to me one day and said, hey, 500 bucks, we'll make a video. We shoot it at the Diamond Club. My favorite video to this day, that's the video the guy's looking at. And he looks over at me and he goes, uh, is the guy smart? I said, man, if you say hello to him and say your name today, and you see him five years from now, and you say something, he's going to know who you are. That's a brilliant business skill, isn't it? You know? I don't know how and, people do and, and, and that was Jeff. And he goes, bullshit. I said, well, I'm just telling you that's how it is. And uh, he goes, okay. I said, uh, the guy's clearly amazing. I mean, he was not a guy that gave out kudos. And he goes, I'll tell you what, bring him out, and if it works out, put you guys in the, in, 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 in the movie. To which my question was, well, how the hell did we end up in the script? And he goes, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, the script describes us. And it turned out, it took a while to find out, the girl and the guy had written the script, written the script, had seen us at Albert's Hall. Wow. So here you go, full circle back to Albert's Hall is and Stevie Ray, and now the, the movie script. I mean, Albert's Hall meant a lot to this band indirectly, the circumstance of, of that full circle thing. Yes. When you Absolutely. think about it, it's wow. amazing. And you mentioned Diamond, which is now the Phoenix, for those of you who don't Sorry, know. Sorry, pardon yeah. me, the, the no, Phoenix. No, that's okay. Which was... Uh, I just uh, want to give uh, the Phoenix a shout out, because they're still doing great Ph shows. Phoenix is great, and uh, Randy Charlton, who, who yeah. was uh, uh, the He was manager. booking at Albert's Hall. He, back, back and forth, day. back and forth. And another guy... Uh, oh, gosh, I'm horrible right now. Yeah, I mentioned uh, uh, Roy uh, Gallagher show or something like that. And he said, I booked that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like 20 yeah. years old. I was like yeah. 35 and the, and, years ago. And, and, and the lady who ran out, who did a lot of bookings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. He, but all these folks, I mean, it, it's funny how everything came back through Toronto. And yet, we couldn't get a goddamn record deal in Toronto. <laughs> it's, it's, so the you know, Arista was from New York. You, you said you moved to New York. No, no, I just flew down. Oh, the, boys. The, the, the one thing about our band is when I met Jeff, he was literally thinking, here, we had this conversation in the back of my head. He was thinking on going to be a radio on-air personality because the music thing, as he put it, wasn't working out. And he knew a lot about music. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Jeff, Jeff said Nobody knew more. that his whole life, you know, the, the parents were bringing in all kinds of different records. It was just anyway, his musical education. He 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 was. We're jumping around, so let's keep jumping. Like oh, I like it. Um, we wrote a song. We did a song called "Making Georgia Blue." It got recorded at our studio in Toronto. And for some reason, the drums weren't on it, or, or, or the drums sucked and we had to be doing it, one or, one or the other, but it was decided that we should use brushes. Now, you know, I was challenged as a drummer because I was a happy guy, I was a jam guy. And all of a sudden, you're in a band, and, and, and that's cool, live. But now you're in studios, and most of the time it's cool, but now you got big time producers, and I didn't realize how much responsibility a drummer has. So Jeff says, look, we're going to cut the kit when we're down here in L.A. And he doesn't tell me the, the, the caveat, which is, I'm out there with these brushes and I'm kind of going to comb your hair. I never use brushes. I, you know, I like beating the hell out of a set of brushes. And my sticks are backwards. And uh, we lay down in first of so this beautiful song, uh, uh, Make Him Georgia Blue. To this day, we are a country here. And what happens is, Jeff's guiding me through it. Then he first take he goes, that's a wrap. And there's a giggle and a laugh. And uh, I'm like, great. And I go in. And there's Jeff sitting with clapping. And Ahmed Erdogan, the, the founder of Atlantic Records. Now, had I known that, there's no fucking way I could lay that track down in a trillion years. And I think Jeff got a kick out of it. But then 
I've forgotten any off the wall conversation about records. And there was some discussion about a 78 record. Was it on NECA? Or was it on Bluebird? And just convinced, whatever he was convinced, and Clapton and the other guy, uh, Mr. Erdogan, are convinced. I think it was Clapton. And um, they have this let's agree to disagree moment. The next day, early on a Sunday, I find myself with Jeff going through all these record places, and Jeff finds the exact version that he had told him it was, and he sends it over to Mr. Erdogan. And it turns out Jeff is right. And, and what I recognized that day, when Jeff wins an argument with the likes of Ahmed Erdogan, who in my opinion is the, you know, the consummate music man, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, Clapton, I realized, holy smokes, wow. this guy knows his stuff. <laughs> The movie, I guess you gave us a bit about how you got into the movie and such like that, but tell me what a challenge that must have been for you know, a rock band from, from Toronto, dealing with Hollywood, dealing with Swayze, and, and did you steal Sam Elliott's voice for a little while? What, like, no, but Sam, but Sam did steal a, a girl I was trying to go with. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Uh, I can't say, I mean, I don't know how far he stole her, but he stole her. Sam Elliott was, Sam Elliott was a man's man. And, and, and yeah, we're doing the movie with Patrick Swayze, but I gotta tell you, the woman loves Sam Elliott. <laughs> and uh, he was just a great guy and a cool guy, and very respectful guy to everybody, crew. And we're, we're a bunch of guys from Canada, no one really knows who the heck we are. Um, in fact, uh, when we first met Patrick, he wasn't, he wasn't a fan. He was kind of ticked off, like, who are you guys and what are you doing here in my movie? And why don't I know it? And, and, and that got a little rough. But uh, as it turned out, we, we became good friends with Patrick. Oh, that's great. Particularly Jeff and Patrick, because Patrick played guitar. Oh. And uh, he, he would sit down and jam with Jeff. You know, and, uh, and, uh, and Sam, I, I met this girl in, in Vancouver, she came down to Hollywood. And uh, she came out in the set one day, and the last time I saw her, she was yeah, driving off in the back of Sam Elliott's Harlow. I might, I mean, she was returned and in good shape and whatnot. Want to give her a shout out? What's her name? A long time ago. And, uh, and I wasn't even upset. I just thought, how cool is that? I mean, you know, here, if, if, if it was here, there might have been a couple of, you know, shots for her, but it's the same that. But, you know, on the back he, of his Harley, you said. On the back of her. Oh, and Sam went though, but Sam was uh, yeah, 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 there. In my memory, was all of them went out of their way to help us. No one, no one was there. Sam and Patrick were really great, particularly Patrick and I. Uh, they befriended us. But the guy who became a really close friend of Jeff's is a guy called Terry Funk, who's a wrestler. He's a big wrestler. One of the bouncers of the. Uh, in, his, well, in real life, he's a famous wrestler, so he has a part as, as yeah, as one of the bouncers. And he was a big hunk of a guy, you know, a real hardcore. I think he was like the, he'd be like the lock of his day. He was a very big time wrestler, manly man, a tough guy, don't mess with me. But he get drunk and he fall asleep on Jeff's couch. And the phone would ring, and it'd be Mr. Funk's, you know, wife looking for him. Oh, Jeff, tell Mama I'm not here. Just tell Mama I'm not here. And this big hunk of a guy, but boy, oh boy, you know, the, 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 the lady was calling the shot. Happy but International Women's Day to her. Happy Inter is it? Oh, yeah. Happy International yeah. Women's Day. Um, Women's Day. But what you realize is they really let us into their lives. And that was really, you know, and, and the next thing you realize, music transcends everything. We weren't movie stars. But we're hanging out with these movie stars. They, you know, and, and let's be clear here. Jeff was an exceptional, exceptional guy. And they realized that. And they had, they weren't as much of, in awe of Jeff as myself and Joe were of them. Because Jeff was in awe of nobody. I really believe in that, that musicians have, have something that, you know, some actors sure are musicians, but that's a quality that a lot of actors have missed the boat on. You know, we're good looking, but we got no skills. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I concur. <laughs> well, 
I mean, I do this show from behind the camera, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got a face for radio. It, 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 if you can see him, he's just joking. He's just joking. He's I'm just in joking. this one. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> um, um, I, 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 I guess so. I mean, every time you hear a, a Ford uh, pickup truck commercial, there's Sam's voice. And, and it tickles me pink because, you know, we got to hang out with the guy. Um, not because not he was a movie star, but because he was a great guy. The, one of the things I always remember with, with, with Patrick is we were at a bar one day. He reached over me and he put out a cigarette in an ashtray with a little glimmer in his eye and a bit of a smile my way. And it was almost like a watch this. The two girls literally got in an argument over a cigarette bar. And I thought, no wonder everyone's nuts at all. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. You know, but well, you, you know, you're rock royalty in Toronto, and I kind of have the same feeling. You know, we're just sitting there at our Christmas party, jamming around, and Tom Stephen gets on the drum. I like, I'm playing a whole lot of love with Jeff Healy. That was the last, oh that my was God, me, that was at Christmas yeah. time on uh, uh, at uh, Brian's. Oh my God, I know you're doing that. By the way, I don't know how to play that song, but it was a lot of fun. Had, it was great. I got the video. Of it. It's amazing. I'll show man, it I forgot about that. that so Son fun, of a man. gun. The guy who brought me up there was Calvin, Calvin. Barry. Calvin, man. Crazy Calvin. Crazy, crazy Calvin. Hey, he's yeah. been a party host for many, many years. As well. well, you know, Calvin, crazy or not, has raised a lot of money for a lot of great causes over the years, yeah. and, and, uh, and I love that. Yeah, great uh, and, uh, and uh, if you're looking for a criminal defense lawyer, <laughs> Calvin in Toronto, Calvin's your guy. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, um, just, just before it gets, because I, I didn't realize this guy's going 530. What I'd like to get to, back to the book for a minute, is, is I ran into Tom Crocker last summer, and I was getting cold feet about putting the book up. We've gotten a publisher, and the book's ready to go, and, uh, and uh, I'm kind of proud of it. And I'm a little apprehensive, and I got some bad medical news, and I was like, ah, am I going to have, you know, the energy to break this, or, and then do I really want to deal with the arguments and the discussion, and maybe some legalities, or whatever. And uh, Tom's playing at a private party, and I went to the private party, and I had no idea it's Tom Crockett. And Tom gets up on stage. There's a hundred people in the room who lose their fucking minds. I mean, talk, that's rock and roll from the camera. You know, talk, you know, a hockey song, you know, Life is a Highway, whatever. And he starts talking halfway through the set about Jeff Huey and the boys. Now, Tom gave us our first national tour. And later, when Jeff discovered Amanda, and we got behind Amanda, Tom gave her her first national tour. So Tom Cochran to the history of my life is huge. First as a fan and then later lucky enough to interact. And he tells his story and another story about Jeff. And at the end he goes, well why the hell isn't Jeff Healy in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? And all of a sudden my buddies are slapping me in the back and you know, you know they haven't said a word to me about being in a Jeff Healy band in 20 years and I'm a big shock as Tom Cochran mentioned it. And it hits me like, yeah. I didn't have that in the book. Like, why is he? And uh, when Tom came off stage, he says, we big hug. We go backstage, there's an after party, and we hung out for a couple hours, telling stories, kind of a couple of beers, and, and I told him what I was up to, and he goes, do it. I said, Tom, I'm gonna say that, that you said that, is that cool? Hell yeah, Tom's that guy, you know? And, and so, going back to what Tom said, and looking into the camera, to those who have any say in this, Jeff Healy was pound for pound, the greatest guitarist who ever came out of this country. Um, recognized by those who mattered worldwide, all of us were proud Canadians who believed in this country. And Jeff should not be forgotten the history, A, and B, he deserves his place. And I'll throw in the band as well, since I'm here. But it's time that we remember the greatness of Jeff Healy at three levels. He overcame huge um, um, obstacles. Um, he um, was probably the pound for pound the greatest guitarist and a hell of a vocalist. And as a band, we were proud Canadians and we carried our flag proudly around the world. And I'll leave you with that. Tom Stevens, musicians in bars getting beer. At Grossman's, 75 years.
goes to the 75th anniversary. And in fact, a great band going on in a half hour. The music never stops. Come on down. Cheers. Be. Real pleasure. Be. Real pleasure. Years over at Graffiti's and... You know, I still do bride's dates, flying dates, and stuff like that. I, I basically yeah. so, so just so play in the corner. Since, since he's making, all, he's not taking it. I thought I recognized you, man. But so you saw, you saw <laughs> us the first time. Yeah. 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 And the phantoms were warming you up, and in between the phantoms, uh, you, uh, Amanda Marshall came out with two guitar players, and I. We were just blown away. I think she did Eleanor Rigby on that. Correct. Right? About five songs, right? Yes, yes. And then we all went into the mezzanine, and the buzz was not the Phantoms. It was, who is that little girl? Yeah, We'd man. never seen her before. I've seen her like four or five times since, but well, well, in different well, variations. Well, right? here we sit in Grossman's. Yeah, and, she was and, discovered and here, right? Jeff, yeah, Jeff saw her here and had her come down and play. Right on. Yeah, man. It's, it's such a small little <laughs> baby. Well, cool. Well, nice to see you again. After what's all your these band? Years, what's your show? Uh, well, there really is no name. Uh, we we, it's just uh, the we call name. it the Kensington Shake because okay. I was walking down the street one day. Steve, the owner of Graffiti's, it's now closed. Yeah. I was walking down the street, just like shaking my head, and he went, "You're doing the Kensington Shake." You know how <laughs> people talk to themselves when they're walking. Around? <laughs> and I went, "Oh, what a great name for a band!" So we've been calling it that ever since. It's a Halloween. Yeah. Right? It's a Halloween. <laughs> anyway, it, it is 75th anniversary of Groceries too. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, I haven't mentioned that. We gotta get it. Paul Martin, thank you for being yeah. on, and Tom Steven, of course. Yeah, thank you, man. <laughs>